Welcome back. Um, the two other futures that is featured in this book, uh, they're imagining futures of continued democratization of tools and what a deeper cultural institution could be like. So, as we've heard, new tools have recently opened the floodgates for an overwhelming creative flow among professionals, amateurs, facilitating the creation of genuinely new types of expression in collaboration with AI. So anyone with access to a computer could create something, whatever their reason for that being. Fun, experimentation, collaboration, or maybe even business, God forbid, no. We're all here for business, right? Um, so in the process, a new array of questions connecting to intellectual property, as we heard, ownership, funding arise. Who owns what in a work that is partly made possible with algorithms trained on existing works? That of Nick Caves, for example. Can creatives opt out of letting their work train the machine? So, as we somehow still worship the at the altar of individuality, this is a quote from the book, one of my favorite phrases in the book. <laughs> As we somehow still worship at the altar of individuality, it's also to point to Yuna's question before. The core group of the foresight process imagined a future where increasingly we organize around niche beliefs and causes, uh, forging more complex systems of governance within micro communities that could result in a completely uh, new cultural institution that is networked and symbiotic and where the responsibility of financial health of the creative sector is distributed and owned and maintained by all, not only the creatives, or all of us, all of, our, all of us creatives. So a new resource consortia that, with novel, novel institutions for distributing, distribution of resources. One could imagine a deeper cultural institution, an alternative institutional model encapsulating all aspects of, in, of an individual's life. Deep culture, if you wish, paraphrasing deep tech. So our next speaker is somebody who's been, who is and has been working among these questions, in and among these questions, at the intersection of music, technology and culture. Sorel Saab is uh, exploring developments in Web3 uh, with a focus on Web3 communities and DAOs, the central autonomous organizations. Uh, Sorel spent um, the last years working with the community project of the, at the creative expression uh, um, platform Colors Studio. Uh, now she's focused on artist management and freelance projects, projects. And Sorel was also a member of the core group I keep referring to, so the 20 people that met in, in the fall. Uh, and she contributed a chapter to the book that I keep talking about that you will soon get a copy of. Um, the role of Web3 in shaping the future of creativity. Please give a warm hand to Sorelsa. Okay. Seniors, shifts in how we connect and collaborate. So, in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to take us on a bit of a journey uh, with my experiences of uh, working and collaborating in different digital communities. And uh, I'm going to do that kind of, yeah, spanning the last 10 years and the experiences I've had in that time. And then through observing those shifts, looking also into the future and kind of where I feel things are heading now. So, uh, as Martin mentioned, I work at the intersection of music, tech and culture. And within the last year, I've also been quite deeply in the Web3 space and experimenting there with how uh, things like blockchain technology can be used to facilitate new ways of structuring communities, new ways of working together, new ways of uh, wealth distribution, valuing art, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll dive into that at times, but some of what I'm exploring also goes a lot broader than Web3. So that's just one aspect of what I'll be talking about today. So I think an interesting context to start with is uh, kind of COVID and how that, I mean, Sweden was a little bit different. We were a little bit more able to still kind of meet at times and maintain some of our normal life. But in a lot of regions around the world, suddenly almost overnight, we shifted to so much of our lives becoming digital. 
and with that we we started to work online a lot more kind of everybody probably remembers like the early sessions on zoom and sort of jumping into these technologies and trying to figure out how things work and how you unmute yourself and stuff uh, and then also kind of after a while realizing that we need uh, the connection online if you're just kind of living alone or with a partner or with some flatmates but apart from that you're not allowed to see anyone you you start craving uh, this community and this collaboration in different ways and I think also times where kind of at scale we're forced to to all start behaving differently really quickly they're interesting hotbeds for innovation as well and, and for things really rapidly changing so uh, for me, also within that time, I formed a lot of really interesting digital connections and saw a lot of new behaviours emerging there, which I'll get into as well a little bit later. But first, I want to take it back to kind of when I was a teenager, uh, 10 years ago in my bedroom, I was living in Australia at the time uh, in Adelaide, and uh, I discovered Tumblr. And so before that, it was very much that my community and kind of what I was being influenced by it was very local, um, just kind of the people around me in Adelaide at the time, people I was going to high school with and stuff. And then suddenly through Tumblr, it opened up a whole new world. And I was seeing quickly that there's a lot of uh, kind of hierarchies and there's like a whole order uh, within Tumblr at the time of different blog styles and different people that were kind of hacking together HTML codes to make your cursor sparkly and stuff. Um, and so looking back now, I've realized that a lot of the elements of collaboration and innovation that are really valuable and also that I'll be talking about a bit later, that they actually existed in these early days in Tumblr. And also now um, when I think about sometimes I work in marketing and strategy as well and a lot of the things that I do, it was actually early principles which I already observed uh, on Tumblr back in the day. And so I keep coming back to that and realize that actually at 14, I kind of, I'd learned a lot in that time, even though some people or parents might think it's a waste of time or something, but we were learning a lot, we were innovating. Uh, so that was a really interesting time and yeah that was kind of my my first um, digital experience of seniors and, and sort of seeing how it can be expanded so with that um, this word seniors i've been mentioning what does it actually mean some of you might have come across the term before uh, it was coined by the music theorist brian eno and uh, it basically the idea was that um, while kind of like an individual could have their own genius Senius refers to the intelligence and intuition of a whole cultural scene. So it's kind of when a group comes together and when they're doing things together and the interplay between different people and things that are occurring, uh, the things that arise from that. So this collective intelligence per se. And then uh, some other people, they went into sort of, uh, they discovered this term and, and went into exploring a little bit more what it means and, and, and trying to throughout history look at some examples of seniors and seeing what are the common factors in it and and can we can we reproduce that or is it something that just spontaneously arises so uh, kevin kelly the founding editor of wired magazine he uh, went through and and really deeply studied this and also was someone who popularized the term more and he came up with four uh, common factors uh, that were present in a lot of the historical examples that he'd been going through so the first one is mutual appreciation, and that is that within a group that has formed, uh, usually around a common interest, though it doesn't always have to be. Um, oh, I should also mention two more things for seniors. Uh, often it has to be that um, these people, they're working on something, they're actually producing something, and also that the group is uh, doing something which in some way lays a foundation for other people to build on and um, kind of for the next generation to come in. So it really is, uh, yeah, that, that something is being produced and, and kind of in a new way, which becomes quite foundational. So anyway, within these groups, uh, yeah, one very important thing, mutual appreciation. So having that positive feedback. Then the second thing that was uh, identified is the rapid exchange of tools and techniques. So that means if you're in a group and someone learns a really cool way of mixing a song in a new way, that they really quickly share that knowledge to other people or you know it can be with AI tools you figure out a cool new hack or way of working with it and you share that to the others so then everybody levels up really quickly and um, yeah so so in that way kind of really quickly instead of people having to individually learn this everybody within the group benefits from the knowledge of this one person and then the next thing is network effects of success so similar principle uh, basically, if one person in the group or, or some people, they have some success in a field or they become a bit more popular, that they kind of also then um, 
sort of bring other people up with that success or also if it's someone's founded a successful startup and they've made money with it they will then maybe other people they know who they were in a similar group with initially they'll maybe go back and they'll fund ideas of other people so that they can also take those things to the next level and then the final thing is local tolerances for novelties so this means uh, a lot of times people when they're innovating they do a lot of really crazy things and sometimes it looks like it doesn't make sense and like they're making a lot of mistakes or wasting a lot of resources and often this can be because they're doing things or experimenting at the edge of what we understand so uh, it cannot yeah sometimes outwardly it doesn't make sense but uh, there needs to be some tolerance and some some understanding for this and, and letting people kind of take that space um, and with Kevin Kelly, he came to the conclusion that seniors was something which could only arise naturally and it can't be artificially created and that if somehow you see it happening somewhere, you should just kind of try your best not to mess it up. Like just don't, don't try and structure it too much, just kind of let them do their thing and hope that it continues working. So um, yeah, and, and this was kind of very much yeah, popularizing the concept more. Then someone called Paki McCormick, who uh, yeah does a lot about like communities and, and business structure and just like changes in culture. He uh, also wrote a longer piece where he kind of came to the conclusion that maybe there are some things you can do to either, if you see early seniors emerging or um, kind of want to try and create an environment for something to maybe happen, he identified some factors uh, which can help in that process. Results are still not guaranteed, but just can sort of, yeah, help things along the way. So uh, the first thing that he identified was emergence from catastrophe. So I think he had about 18 examples he went through and a lot of those, they were kind of uh, occurred during or after some really big life-changing event. And I think, as I was mentioning before, COVID right now for us could also be something one of those factors which um, you know a lot of innovation occurred and I think in the coming years we'll still see ideas which were born then or kind of sparked then um, sort of coming into the next level and becoming bigger and more popular. Then the second one is competition so the idea here is that um, within a group you are competing with each other and trying to level up or maybe that there's somehow a spot for one person to publish their song and everybody has to pitch why their song is the best. So kind of just really pushing each other to do uh, better within the group is really important to, to also keep that momentum. The third one is place-based ritual. And as we saw during COVID, this can also take um, form online in digital spaces. But the idea is basically that you have, um, yeah, maybe once a week or something, or the cadence can vary, but that you have a time and a place where this group comes together and, and where they know also they're going to have to show some kind of work or critique something or you just yeah have that accountability and, and that rhythm in it basically. And then finally, diversity of thought and experience uh, because I think it's just the idea of having different perspectives and challenging things in new ways that's also gonna help people level up. And if everybody is thinking the same too much, then maybe you, kind of reach a point where you stagnate a bit, similar to how we were talking about before with AI, how that can bring in kind of a completely new perspective and open up a new door. I think this is a similar concept. So um, as I mentioned before, I think especially during COVID, but also before, we have seen that seniors uh, can move beyond physical geography. And I still think there's, there's definitely a place for the physical and a place for the digital but um, that very much things it's possible for them to also be born online and live online and for people to also really benefit from those group structures. So as I mentioned before, during the COVID period when um, yeah, there was a lot of lockdowns, especially like at the beginning of COVID, I was living in Germany. So they also had really harsh lockdowns there and kind of for weeks or months, we weren't really able to go out and do much at all. Uh, but interestingly for me, this opened up kind of a whole world of um, being able to digitally connect with people. And three platforms where that happened for me uh, was Arena, which is a kind of a curation platform where you can connect ideas. And if you want to make a mood board or you're writing an essay or something, people kind of connect those into concepts. And the nice thing with Arena is I think right now there's only about 14,000 users on the platform. so. It's a really interesting group of people that is there as well. And you're really easily able to see connections between these people. So I, yeah, that opened up a whole new world for me. Secondly, Discord, uh, because on that platform, you're able to have smaller groups and kind of really organize um, 
who gets let into what group and what part of the group and stuff. So I think it's not Discord as a technology per se. That was the interesting thing, but just this idea of smaller online groups and within Web3. Uh, so I was experimenting a lot with these uh, yeah, communities that, that bring in some, some blockchain elements or use things like NFTs to allow access to certain regions of the group. Um, just quickly, also an NFT for people that maybe don't know what that term means, I'll just explain it very simply, uh, stands for non-fungible token. And it basically just means uh, that it's, if you um, kind of purchase a piece of art with cryptocurrency, it's just a very verifiable way of saying that you own that one copy and it cannot be copied. So. Uh, yeah, so we were experimenting with with some things, uh, also using those kind of as a digital membership pass and then opening up certain parts of the group for that. And on Discord, I also met a lot of other interesting Web3 communities and people were in a lot of communities as well. I'll talk about that a bit later. And then finally, Twitter, uh, because that was where a lot of people that were in Web3 also that became their kind of more public facing part where they were talking about things. So. Prior to this, I was hardly using Twitter and then suddenly I really jumped in and learned a lot. And also on Twitter, it's nice because you can really, through what people retweet, kind of see who is in their seniors and who their little group is. And I also, for some people I found interesting, I went through the list of people they were following and then just kind of followed all of those people. And it's really, you can dive into a network without being part of it initially. So yeah, the seniors of early Web3 communities. So. Um, I was mainly, I mean, Web3 communities, they've existed prior to last year, but in 2022, there was a really big boom in uh, people experimenting with it. Also, this concept that uh, Martin mentioned before, the DAO, uh, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, basically just a community structure where people can uh, together govern over certain funds and, and make decisions together that are, again, registered on the blockchain, so everybody votes. Um, but the interesting thing with this was that there was a lot of innovation occurring. People were really, a lot of these concepts that I described with seniors, people were really pushing each other to level up, to get things out quickly, to share half finished work, to ask for advice. And uh, also a lot of people, they were in more than one community. So there was a lot of knowledge sharing between these different groups. And people also, if you went on Twitter, they everyone had these communities listed in their bio. So people were also really seeing it as a pillar of their identity in a way, which I think is also really interesting and uh, was kind of also something we talked about at times in the foresight cycle, kind of this idea of like tribes and different groups and identities. Um, but that's a different thing. Anyway, so mainly just what I found interesting was there was so much innovation and, and fresh energy occurring in this space within the past year. Then I also want to go uh, to some other kind of more in real life examples, which, which I've observed. One of them is a fashion brand called Kid Super. Um, or I mean, yeah, he does fashion, but he does everything. He, he paints, he animates videos, he's produced with artists. Um, they basically, yeah, they like to think out of the box and just pitch really crazy stuff to people. But for the past five years, I've been sort of following the progress of this brand on Instagram and just saw people come in and out of the community they were building and how all of those people have really leveled up. So. Kid Super, he um, had a physical store in New York and also built a music studio in the bottom of that. And so some, he had like some friends who were trying to become artists, like music artists, and they had no money, but he was like, oh, you can just stay in the basement and they produce songs. And a lot of them are doing really, really well right now. Like there's an artist called Russ, um, who is huge these days, who had his early days here. Um, another French artist called Lolo Zouai. So, yeah, a lot of interesting things and kind of when you look at all the people he's connected to or who show up to his events now, it's a lot of people that are very high profile now. And I think a lot of this comes down to this physical location he had. Um, but the interesting part for me is also that he has been really documenting this story the whole time online. And so me as well as a teenager, or I think I found this about five years ago and have been sort of following it really closely and was very inspired by it. I feel like I'm part of the sort of extended seniors of that group. And I've been really influenced by it, although I'm not directly collaborating. So I think that's an interesting trend, which I'm seeing emerging as well. Uh, then, yeah, a couple of like even newer things which are happening. Uh, there's one DJ collective uh, started in Paris called 99 Ginger and also New Currency, which is primarily a magazine, but they also do a lot of other things. And they kind of describe themselves as a youth platform for sharing ideas. 
And both of these things are really interesting because they um, kind of, yeah, have movements and concepts they're trying to share and they do it via creativity. And for them, the IRL and the digital, they're very much, they go hand in hand. It's 50-50. They have strong physical communities kind of in the spaces they're in, but then really have an extended group of supporters around them, which they're sharing knowledge with all the time and kind of getting feedback from. And they'll put out half-baked ideas on Twitter and get really quick feedback and then integrate that back into whatever they're doing. So I think that's really interesting. And I think there's, there's a big trend kind of there coming as well of, those stories being shared really early. And that's kind of, yeah, what I've already been alluding to, this idea of extended seniors, um, which is, I don't think this exists as a term, it's just kind of what I've called it for now. Um, but this extended seniors via digital tools, and, and that's the idea that as something is developing, like yes, there'll be a core group, but that people can very much now, if things are being shared online, if things are being open sourced and shared in half finished forms, that kind of anyone who is following that or who discovers that can jump in and, and be part of that and also be inspired. And then maybe you'll have in another physical location um, a small group of people who get together around the same concepts, they start developing something, maybe eventually the groups merge and do something together. So this for me is extremely interesting and it also opens up kind of this idea of uh, you don't need to live in a certain location or big city to be part of some of these movements. And I think that's also going to unlock so much more innovation, so much more creativity. So really, really interested in this trend that I'm seeing. And with that, uh, I'm kind of also, yeah, just as a thought experiment, kind of want to throw out there for us uh, these ideas of seniors and collaboration and community. Where might that go in 10 years? Or if we look 50 years into the future, uh, where might that be then? And I think it's hard to predict because, I mean, things are moving so fast. We, we've seen with AI kind of, uh, yeah, how rapidly things are moving. Um, but I think for me, because I, when I started this, I started with 10 years ago on Tumblr, back then what I was doing. So now I'm just going to throw out a few ideas for 10 years into the future where things could go. But these are very much just a conversation starter. And then I'd love to also in the question round kind of keep uh, yeah, thinking on these and also hear other opinions and other trends in the room. So I think this first one um, we've been seeing already um, a lot, this idea of increased digital connectivity, but also craving offline community. I think this was very much uh, in kind of the, the intense COVID lockdown times, this happened as well, that there was so much digital happening, but then at the same time people were like, oh, I just want to be offline with two friends and go for a hike and turn my phone off for a week. So. I think if we also look at things like AI content generation, specifically kind of around social media and uh, short form videos and stuff, uh, people, that's going to become uh, quite saturated and, and people are going to be craving something that feels a little bit more human again, whether it's actually human, who knows, maybe the AI will get really good at writing those human things. Um, but yeah, and then there's also kind of within communities now, there's also there's so much that's like branded or monetized uh, and, and sometimes also through that can feel not so authentic or like it's being pushed in a certain direction. So I think, yeah, this this craving of authenticity and offline that's really uh, coming back as well and going to be interesting to see uh, also if things like VR, for example, when you can meet up in VR, whether that um, sort of helps and people want that or whether it's something that, again, they're like, oh, it's too digital, I don't want that, we'll see. Uh, then the second thing is the larger digital global seniors, and that's this idea of uh, where we live playing less of a role. And I think that's also really interesting when we think about lifestyles, when we think about climate change, how the world could look in the future. Uh, the fact that we can still uh, innovate and be really creative, but maybe we can at times do that with people who aren't directly physically located in the same place as us. Then I also think we're going to see even faster cycles of seniors and new things emerging. And, and that's kind of due to the fact that ideas, tools, techniques, aesthetics, ideologies, these things can spread faster than ever. It can be someone has an idea and then they write an essay on it, uh, publish that on Twitter, and then suddenly a lot of people resonate with it and, and they start building on that. So I think, uh, yeah, and, and kind of having those things spread quickly means that then there's, there's faster cycles of, of people picking that up and doing new things with it. Um, and then another one, we've already kind of like touched on this concept a bit today as well, I think, but it's this idea of individualism versus valuing community, because I think 
in some ways, uh, in some regions, there are trends of people becoming again a lot more individual and egocentric and kind of wanting to protect all the IP and just do things very secretly. Um, but then as we've heard kind of also with AI or with groups that you work with, there is so much value in also open sourcing and having things at times when it makes sense to do a little bit more public so that you can get that direct feedback from other people as well. So yeah, I think that's gonna be kind of an interesting dichotomy that just continues uh, to, to play out. And finally, we've talked about this one a lot, but AI as a collaborator, I think, uh, especially this idea of AI being able to help us break out of the limits of, of human thinking and kind of the way we think things should be done. That's really interesting because then you can kind of start from zero again. And I often think about this concept in general, uh, also children, you know, when they come into the world, they, they're very creative with the way they um, perceive things. Like if they have a glass or something, they'll be like, oh, you know, uh, I'll put it like this, it's a play thing, or like, oh, it fell on the floor, okay, it's broken. And you don't have these preconceived uh, notions until people tell you, oh, it's a glass, you drink from it, you, you put it like this, you don't spell things. And I think AI can kind of help us get into that mindset again a little bit, which is, is valuable very much. And yeah, with that, uh, I'd like to finish and just also let you think about what futures do you dream of? Because this is some trends, but I also think we can very much always create uh, and, and play a role in the futures that we want to see. And then finally, also, what trends are you seeing? What experiences have you had? I think also based on kind of different life experiences, different generations, people have also seen different cycles of these types of groups. And this is very much just my kind of Gen Z perspective, I suppose. So yeah, very interested to, to hear about that. Thank you. Thank you very much.